small leak, the spark of metal against metal, or the light of a careless cigarette can turn a million dollar drilling rig into a heap of smoldering rubble. And the men on it into charred and unrecognizable hulks. What can you do to prevent this kind of disaster? And once it started, what can you do to stop it? I like the belly buster over there. Oh yeah, that was good. That's a fun one, isn't it? Oh yeah, that's a good part. First time I looked at that, I said, oh, no way they're gonna get me in there. That's what, uh, this is what we've been asking them for all day. I just did let those guys feel the heat and put it out. Easy to feel the heat. Not all rig fires have to end like this. With the mast, a twisted heap of crumpled metal. Most fires start small, grease in the galley, or a short circuit in the motor room. And they can be controlled if your crew knows how to handle the emergency. That means knowing the equipment, knowing the kind of fire you're fighting, and most of all, it means training and teamwork. The following program will introduce the basic concepts of firefighting. But the most important kind of learning, that is, hands-on instruction and regular drill, still depend on you. The skills one man acquires in fire training school must be passed along to the rest of the crew. Remember, if a blaze suddenly breaks out, the safety of every man on the rig could easily depend on the firefighting practices of the least informed member of the crew. So just as in every other operation in oil well drilling, teamwork and training will be your key to fire safety on the rig. In order to fight a fire, the first thing you need to know is what is a fire. Every fire has the same three basic elements in common. First, a fuel source, such as wood, paper, metal, or flammable liquids like diesel, alcohol, or the gas escaping from this leaky valve. Second, a heat source, such as arcing wires, metal sparks, or the careless cigarette you've been warned not to smoke. And third, air, or to be quite specific, oxygen. Without all these three essential elements, there can be no fire. In other words, if you remove any one of them, the fuel, the heat, or the oxygen, your fire will go out. How can you tell which element to remove? Well, it all depends on what's burning. To help you decide what kind of extinguishing material you should use on various types of blazes, three kinds of fires and the extinguishers appropriate for each one are explained in this program. Let's go through them one by one. A Class A fire is fueled by any ordinary combustible material. That means any material which, when it burns, leaves an ash such as wood, paper, or this trash. What's the easiest and most effective way to put out a Class A fire? Generally, by cooling it down. Water is your most effective cooling agent. You've got water lines available on every rig, even when there aren't fire hoses. So, what should you do in an emergency? That depends on how big the fire is. Remember, at least 90% of all fires start out small. And, if they're found soon enough, can be put out with a portable extinguisher. If the contents of the extinguisher will put out ordinary combustibles, such as wood, paper, and trash, then the fire extinguisher will be marked with a green triangle 
and a capital A. Well, what if it's not a trash fire? Suppose a pan of grease in the galley catches fire, or any other flammable liquid, such as the diesel in the pit, goes up in flames. These are called Class B fires. Reach for an extinguisher. If it's marked with the red square and a capital B, the contents will put out grease fires and other flammable liquids. When you've made sure the extinguisher is charged and ready to go, cautiously enter the fire area and direct the contents of the extinguisher in a sweeping motion at the base of the flames. Be careful not to splash the liquid. This will only spread the fire. And if one extinguisher isn't enough, be sure you've got other members of the crew ready to go. Firefighting is a team effort in which everyone's safety is at stake. Class C fires may even be more dangerous because the capital C in the blue circle stands for an energized electrical fire. They often occur in the motor room or SCR house where a short circuit or sparking wires can cause the blaze. In order to extinguish this type of fire, first turn off the power which is feeding the flames. And then, to make sure you're safe, use a Class C fire extinguisher. The C on the label means the contents of the extinguisher will not conduct electricity. Can you remember all this? Let's stop for a moment and review. In the initial part of this program, we covered two major aspects of firefighting. First, in order to fight a fire, you must know what it is. Every fire is made up of the same three elements. A fuel source, like your diesel tank. A heat or ignition source. and oxygen. Second, to put out any fire, you simply remove one of the three essential elements. This is precisely the principle on which each kind of fire extinguisher works. Now, if you've got the principles down pat, let's continue with the second part of the program and go out on the fire field to talk about what's in each type of extinguisher and how to use each one. Remember, you can always tell what kind of fire an extinguisher will put out by glancing at the label. But if you know what's in each type, you'll understand why they work the way they do. Let's start with a very common one on the rig, a dry chemical unit. Inside the extinguisher is 20 or 30 pounds of dry chemical, such as sodium bicarbonate, which is the active ingredient in putting out the fire. The sodium bicarbonate dry chemical is just a fancy form of baking soda, which, as you know, works real well to put out grease fires. However, you can't just dump 30 pounds of it over a grease fire in the galley, like you could sprinkle a box of baking soda over some burning grease on the stove at home. So, the extinguisher is provided with a substance, generally a gas, which will act as a propellant to force the dry chemical out of the pressurized vessel. For one type of dry chemical extinguisher, the gas sits in a separate chamber alongside of the dry chemical chamber. So they call this type of dry chemical unit a cartridge type. In another type, the gas and the dry chemical are both stored inside the same pressurized vessel. So this one is called a stored pressure type. Let's look first at the cartridge type. 
If you cut one apart, it would look like this on the inside. Now, in order to make it work, you have to pressurize the dry chemical, which would normally be sitting inside here. By pulling this pin, which is a safety device. Once you've pulled it, then you can press the lever, which will release the gas in the cartridge and it will flow through this small tube into the dry chemical chamber. What you're doing when you charge this kind of unit is punching a hole in the seal of the CO2 cartridge so that when you strike the lever with your fist, the gas, which is stored at a very high pressure, about 850 PSI, rushes into the dry chemical powder and charges it. However, you've got to be careful when you charge the extinguisher because there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Let's watch one of the fire school instructors do it right. First, pick up the hose from the holster with one hand and place it between your thumb and the carrying handle so you've got it under control. Then, with the extinguisher's nozzle pointing away from you, charge the extinguisher by striking the firing mechanism with the ball of your fist. Can you see what's wrong with the way he's doing it here? Don't ever stand over the extinguisher when you charge it. It's possible that the last time the extinguisher was filled, the cap wasn't screwed on properly. If you suddenly charge the dry chemical with 850 PSI and that cap's not on tight, it's going to blow. And if you're standing right over it, you're going to be in bad shape. Hold it with the nozzle pointed away from you and don't bend over it as you charge it. Once it's charged, take hold of the nozzle and before you step any closer to the fire, to press the lever once to make sure the thing's working right. There's a basic technique for getting the fire out quickly and thoroughly. Let's go through it with one of the fire school students. If it's a flammable liquid spill, like this diesel pit we'll use for an example, you should be standing on the upwind side of the fire so that it's not blowing towards you. Then you want to aim your dry chemical stream six inches ahead of the fire, not right at it. Why? You've got to put out that leading edge first. If you don't, it will reflash or start up again every single time. The reason for this is the dry chemical works by extinguishing the chain reaction between whatever is burning, the fuel, and the air, or oxygen. All it does is knock down the flames. That's it. Dry chemical does not eliminate or get rid of the fuel, nor does it cool anything down. This means if you aim the stream too high, your flames will creep back on you because there's enough oxygen for combustion to take place. But if you aim too low, you'll end up splashing the flammable liquid and spreading the fire. So, aim just above the liquid level of the fuel and just below the flames, that is, right at the base of the flames. That's where the combustion is taking place. Direct the chemical stream in a sweeping motion from one side of the spill to the other making sure to extinguish the edges of the fire so it doesn't come back on you. Always work from the front of the fire to the back, continuing the side-to-side -side sweeping motion until you've got it out. When you think it's out, you should still treat it like an enemy. Don't ever turn your back on it and just walk away. Back out. 
with your hose still ready, remember, dry chemical only interrupts the fire's chemical chain reaction. It can always reflash. Once the fire's out, you need to take care of the extinguisher so it will work right the next time. With the cartridge type dry chemical extinguisher, this means getting rid of any chemical left inside the vessel or hose. To do this, turn the extinguisher upside down. Hold the hose up so you don't get a mouthful or an eyeful of chemical and depress the lever until the rest of the dry chemical and gas are totally expelled. One last thing to remember. Always call your service company immediately so they'll come right out and refill the extinguishers. You can be a crack shot at putting out fires, but it's not going to do you a whole lot of good if there's no chemical in that extinguisher. By now, you should feel pretty familiar with the cartridge type dry chemical extinguisher. There's one other type of dry chemical unit we mentioned a little while back, a stored pressure dried chemical extinguisher. It works along the same lines as the cartridge type, except that the dry chemical and the propellant gas are both stored inside the same pressurized vessel. On this one, there's a gauge, which will tell you if the pressure inside the extinguisher is still within the proper working range, or whether it needs to be refilled. If the extinguisher has not been used, there should be a visual seal, like this one, which is unbroken. In order to use the extinguisher, first glance at the pressure gauge to make sure it still reads good. Then pull the pin. Grab the hose and depress the lever to make sure it's working. As for your firefighting technique, it doesn't change from one dry chemical unit to another. You still start with the leading edge. Work from the front of the fire towards the back. Sweeping your chemical stream from one side of the spill to the other. Making sure to extinguish the edges as you go along so it doesn't reflash. Maintenance on this extinguisher is just like the cartridge type. Turn the stored pressure unit upside down and gas off the extinguisher. If it seems like a waste of dry chemical, it's really not. Once you've pulled the pin and broken the seal between the expellent gas and the chemical, you must have the unit cleaned out and refilled before it will work again. As soon as the seal is broken, all the propellant gas will leak off. A couple more maintenance tips about stored pressure extinguishers. First, check every now and then to make sure the powder inside the extinguisher feels loose. This is a problem when they're stored in areas of high vibration, such as a drill rig floor. You should also check them out after they've been jounced around in the back of a truck when you're rigging up or down. A few trips like that can pack the dry chemical into a compact mass and then it won't come out when you try to use the extinguisher. Second, don't let the extinguishers ever sit on the rig floor. Hang them up instead. Remember, these are pressurized vessels, and if corrosion forms around the bottom, it could weaken them. Dry chemical units are very common on the rig and very useful. However, there's one place on the rig where you don't want to use a dry chemical extinguisher because it will gum up the works. You must not use a dry chemical where delicate electrical contacts are located because it will corrode them. Therefore, if you've got a fire in the SCR house, reach for a CO2 or a halon extinguisher. 
Halon works just like dry chemical by breaking up the fire's chain reaction. Its advantage, however, is that it's a clean agent and mixes with the air. CO2, or carbon dioxide extinguishers, are also commonly used for electrical fires. But you should remember a couple of things about carbon dioxide before you pull the pin. Most important, CO2 is a gas, and the way it works is by displacing enough oxygen in the air so that the fire is smothered. Whenever the oxygen content in the air goes below 16%, the fire will go out. The only problem is that you'll go out too. People need just the same amount of oxygen that a fire does in order to survive. CO2 is very convenient in so-called fixed systems. But when the alarm bell goes off, you've got 20 seconds to get out of the room before the CO2 cartridges fire. Inside an enclosed space like the SCR house, the CO2 will displace approximately 40% of the air. Outside, however, if you're using a portable CO2 unit, its stream reach is pretty short, about 3 to 8 feet, and it just won't work if there's a wind blowing. The CO2 will simply blow away. The CO2 extinguisher handles pretty much like the others. Pick up the hose, pull the pin to break the seal, depress the lever, and with any breeze to your back, start at the base of the flames. Inside a small space, it's quite effective, and it won't corrode expensive electrical equipment. Outside, however, you generally have a much better chance of getting the fire out with a dry chemical extinguisher. While halon and CO2 are especially good for electrical fires and dry chemical extinguishers generally work on them, there's one thing you have to remember. Don't ever put the contents of a Class A or AB extinguisher on an energized electrical fire. This model even tells you that right on the label. Why not? Well, Class A types, you remember, are for ordinary combustibles like trash or anything which will burn and leave an ash. Since the easiest and cheapest way to put out these fires is with water, what's inside your Class A extinguisher is probably water. or a fancy form of water, like aqueous film-forming foam, nicknamed AFFF, and sometimes called light water. Unlike regular water, AFFF has special properties which make it usable on flammable liquids, as you can see here from the label. The secret ingredient in this foam is a surfactant, or synthetic soap, which works by decreasing the surface tension of the water. So that if you're fighting a grease or gasoline fire, like the one in our diesel pit, the AFFF foam is so light it floats on top, thus diminishing the fire's air supply, fuel vapors, and cooling everything down. To activate the extinguisher, follow the usual set of procedures Pick up the hose and pull the pin. Glance at the gauge and pre-test the extinguisher by depressing the lever before you advance towards the fire. You'll notice, however, that there are several special things about the way this extinguisher works. First, there's an air aspirating nozzle, which helps foam up the water and make it light. Second, your firefighting techniques are slightly different. In this case, you want to build a foam blanket over the fire, which means you have to be very careful. Anything which disturbs the blanket of foam, such as a breeze or a stream from another fire extinguisher, if someone's helping you fight the blaze, can break up the foam 
and allow the fire to reflash or start up again. Like all others, this extinguisher should be emptied of its contents when the fire is out. Then call your service company to refill it immediately. Can you remember all this? Let's have one short last review. You can put out fires by removing any one of the fire's essential elements, the fuel, the heat, or the oxygen, or by preventing the chemical chain reaction which occurs when all the elements for a fire are present. That's how your fire extinguishers work. Water in a Class A extinguisher or ordinary combustibles removes the heat source. Foam, used in a Class AB extinguisher for ordinary combustibles and flammable liquids, slows down fuel vapors, diminishes the air supply, and cools down the fuel. Dry chemical, used in Class ABC extinguishers, stops the fire by preventing a chain reaction between the three elements which make up the fire. And halon, or CO2, used in Class C energized electrical fires, work by stopping the chain reaction or by smothering it. Teamwork, training, and good fire safety habits will keep your rig looking like this. Instead of like this.